increase in dopamine from a cold water exposure of this kind was comparable to what one sees from cocaine, except, except. So let's talk about dopamine. The way that your body uses dopamine is to have a baseline level of dopamine, meaning an amount of dopamine that's circulating in your brain and body all the time. And that turns out to be important for how you feel generally, whether or not you're in a good mood, motivated, et cetera. And you also can experience peaks in dopamine above baseline. Please remember this, that when you experience something or you crave something really desirable, what happens afterwards is your baseline level of dopamine drops. And you might think, oh, a big peak in dopamine. After that, I'm going to feel even better because I just had this great event. Not the case. What actually happens is that your baseline level of dopamine drops. And I will explain the precise mechanism for that. We refer to this as tonic and phasic release of dopamine. Tonic being the low level baseline that's always there circulating, released into your brain all the time. And then phasic, these peaks that ride above that baseline. And those two things interact. And this is really important. And I'm excited to teach you about dopamine because dopamine has everything to do with how you feel right now as you're listening to this. It has everything to do with how you will feel an hour from now, it has everything to do with your level of motivation and your level of desire and your willingness to push through effort. If ever you've interacted with somebody who just doesn't seem to have any drive or if you've interacted with somebody who seems to have endless drive and energy, what you are looking at there in those two circumstances is the difference in the level of dopamine circulating in their system. Dopamine is what we call a neuromodulator. Modulators influence the communication of many neurons. Imagine a bunch of people dancing where it's a coordinated dance involving 10 or 20 or hundreds of people. Neuromodulators are coordinating that dance. What this means is that dopamine release changes the probability that certain neural circuits will be active and that other neural circuits will be inactive. And that's why it's so powerful at shifting not just our levels of energy, but also our mindset, also our feelings of whether or not we can or cannot accomplish something. How does dopamine work and what does it do? Well, first of all, it is not just responsible for pleasure. It is responsible for motivation and drive primarily at the psychological level, also for craving. Those three things are sort of the same, motivation, drive, and craving. It is also vitally important for movement in diseases like Parkinson's or Lewy's body's dementia. There is a depletion or death of dopamine neurons at a particular location in the brain, which leads to shaky movements, challenges in speaking, challenges in particular in initiating movement, and also experience drops in motivation and affect, meaning mood. They tend to get depressed and so on. Way that dopamine is released in the brain and body can differ, meaning it can be very local or it can be more broad. Now, most of you have probably heard of synapses. Synapses are the little spaces between neurons and basically neurons, nerve cells communicate with one another by making each other electrically active or by making each other less electrically active. And the way that one nerve cell causes the next nerve cell to fire is that it vomits out these little packets, what we call vesicles. They're little bubbles filled with a chemical. When that chemical enters the synapse, it, some of it docks or parks on the other side in the other neuron. And that chemical will make that neuron more electrically active or less electrically active. Dopamine can do that like any other neurotransmitter or neuromodulator, but dopamine can also engage in what's called a volumetric release. Volumetric release is like a giant vomit that gets out to 50 or 100 or even thousands of cells. For those of you that are only interested in tools, like how do I get more dopamine? This part is really important because if you were to take a drug or supplement that increases your level of dopamine, you are influencing both the local release of dopamine and volumetric release. This relates back to the baseline of dopamine and the big peak above baseline. And indeed, many supplements that increase dopamine will actually make it harder for you to sustain dopamine release over long periods of time and to achieve those peaks that most of us are craving when we are in pursuit of things. Because if you get both volumetric release, the dumping out of dopamine everywhere, and you're getting local release, 
what it means is that the difference between the peak and baseline is likely to be smaller. And how satisfying or exciting or pleasurable a given experience is doesn't just depend on the height of that peak. It depends on the height of that peak relative to the baseline. So if you increase the baseline and you increase the peak, you're not going to achieve more and more pleasure from things. Just increasing your dopamine, yes, it will make you excited for all things. It will make you feel very motivated, but it will also make that motivation very short-lived. There's a better way to optimize this peak to baseline ratio. When you do or ingest certain things, your levels of dopamine will rise above baseline transiently. And depending on what you do or ingest, it will rise either more or less and it will be very brief or it'll last a long time. So let's take a look at some of the typical things that people take and do and eat. Some are good for us, some are not good for us. And let's ask how much dopamine is increased above baseline. Chocolate will increase your baseline level of dopamine 1.5 times. It's transient, it goes away after a few minutes or even a few seconds. Sex, both the pursuit of sex and the act of sex increases dopamine two times. So it's a doubling above baseline. Nicotine, in particular, nicotine that is smoked increases dopamine two and a half times above baseline. It is very short-lived. Cocaine will increase the level of dopamine in the bloodstream two and a half times above baseline. And amphetamine, Another drug that increases dopamine will increase the amount of dopamine in the bloodstream 10 times above baseline. Exercise. Now, exercise will have a different impact on the levels of dopamine depending on how much somebody subjectively enjoys that exercise. So if you're somebody who loves running, chances are it's going to increase your levels of dopamine two times above your baseline. People who dislike exercise will achieve less dopamine increase or no increase in dopamine from exercise. So for people that hate exercise, you can think about some aspect of exercise that you really enjoy. However, I will caution you against saying to yourself, I hate exercise or I hate studying or I hate this person, but I love the reward I give myself afterward. They won't make you like exercise more or studying more. They actually will undermine the dopamine release that would otherwise occur for that activity. Now I've been alluding to this dopamine peaks versus dopamine baseline thing since the beginning of the episode. I talked about tonic and phasic release and so forth. But now let's really drill into what this means and how to leverage it for our own purposes. We often think, oh, okay, I'm gonna pursue the win. I'm gonna I'm going to run this marathon. I'm going to train for this marathon. Then you run the marathon and you finish, you cross the finish line. You feel great. And you would think, okay, now I'm set for the entire year. I'm going to feel so much better. I'm going to feel this accomplishment in my body. It's going to be so great. But that's not what happens. Your level of dopamine has actually dropped below baseline. Now, eventually it will ratchet back up. The extent to which it drops below baseline is proportional to how high the peak was. So if you cross the finish line, pretty happy, it won't drop that much. You cross the finish line ecstatic, well, a day or two later, you're going to feel quite a bit lower than you would otherwise. You might not be depressed because it depends on where that baseline was to begin with. But the so-called postpartum depression that people experience after giving birth or after some big win, a graduation or any kind of celebration, that postpartum drop in mood and affect and motivation is the drop in baseline dopamine. It also explains the behavior that most of us are familiar with of engaging in something that we really enjoy, going to a restaurant that we absolutely love or engaging in some way with some person that we really, really enjoy. But if we continue to engage in that behavior over and over again, it kind of loses its edge. Some of us experience that drop in excitement more quickly and more severely than others but everyone experiences that to some extent. Some of you may be hearing this and think, no, 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 that's not how it works for me. I'm just riding higher and higher all the time. I love my kids. I love my job. I love school. I love wins. I, I don't want losses. I agree. Oftentimes we are feeling good because we are layering in different 
aspects of life, consuming things and doing things that increase our dopamine. We're getting those peaks. But afterward, the drop in baseline occurs and it always takes a little while to get back to our stable baseline. And if we continue to indulge in the same behaviors or even different behaviors that increase our dopamine in these big peaks over and over and over again, we won't experience the same level of joy from those behaviors or from anything at all. So how are we supposed to engage with these dopamine evoking activities in ways that are healthy and beneficial for us? How do we achieve these peaks, which are so central to our well-being and experience of life without dropping our baseline? The key lies in intermittent release of dopamine. Key is to not expect or chase high levels of dopamine release every time we engage in these activities. Intermittent reward schedules are the central schedule by which casinos keep you gambling, elusive partners or potential partners keep you texting and pursuing on either side of the relationship. Intermittent schedules are the way that the internet and social media and all highly engaging activities keep you motivated and pursuing. There's something called dopamine reward prediction error. When we expect something to happen, we are highly motivated to pursue it. If it happens, great, we get the reward. The reward comes in various chemical forms, including dopamine. And we are more likely to engage in that behavior again. This is the basis of casino gambling. This is how they keep you going back again and again and again, even though on average, the house really does win. If you're not a gambler and that doesn't appeal to you, I have to imagine there's something that appeals to you, something that you do repeatedly because you enjoy it. And almost inevitably, it's because there's an intermittent schedule. There's a intermittent schedule by which dopamine sometimes arrives, sometimes a little bit, sometimes a lot, sometimes a medium amount, okay? That intermittent reinforcement schedule is actually the best schedule to export to other activities. How do you do that? First of all, if you are engaged in activities, school, sport, relationship, et cetera, where you experience a win, you should be very careful about allowing yourself to experience huge peaks in dopamine unless you're willing to suffer the, the crash that follows. Well, let's say you are somebody who really does enjoy exercise, or let's say you're somebody who kind of likes exercise, but forces yourself to do it, but you make it pleasurable by giving yourself your favorite cup of coffee first, or maybe taking a pre-workout drink or taking an energy drink or listening to your favorite music. And then you're in the gym and you're listening to your music. That all sounds great, right? It is great, except that by layering together all these things to try and achieve that dopamine release and by getting a big peak in dopamine, you're actually increasing the number of conditions required to achieve pleasure from that activity again. But there's also a version of this where sometimes you don't do the dopamine enhancing activities. You don't ingest anything to increase your dopamine. You just do the exercise. You don't do the exercise and expect dopamine to arrive through some what we call exogenous source as well. You might think, well, that sounds lame. I want to continue to enjoy exercising. Ah, but that's exactly the point. If you want to maintain motivation for school, exercise, relationships, or pursuits of any duration and kind, the key thing is to make sure that the peak in dopamine, if it's very high, doesn't occur too often. And if something does occur very often, that you vary how much dopamine you experience with each engagement in that activity. Now, some activities naturally have this intermittent property woven into them, right? We sometimes have classes that we like and other classes we don't like. We don't always get straight A's. Sometimes we don't get rewarded with the outcome that we would like. We don't always have the perfect relationship outcome. But understand that your ability to experience motivation and pleasure for what comes next is dictated by how much motivation and pleasure and dopamine you experienced prior. The reason I can't give a very specific protocol like delete dopamine or lower dopamine every third time is that that wouldn't be intermittent. The whole basis of intermittent reinforcement is that you don't really have a specific schedule of when dopamine is going to be high and when dopamine is going to be low and when dopamine is going to be medium. That's a predictable schedule, not a random intermittent schedule. So do like the casinos do, it certainly works for them. 
and four activities that you would like to continue to engage in over time, whatever those happen to be, start paying attention to the amount of dopamine and excitement and pleasure that you achieve with those and start modulating that somewhat at random. That might be removing some of the dopamine releasing chemicals that you might take prior. Maybe you remove them every time, but then every once in a while you introduce them. Maybe it involves sometimes doing things socially that you enjoy doing socially, sometimes doing the same thing, but alone. For those of you that are begging for more specificity, we can give you a tool. One would be you can flip a coin before engaging in any of these types of activities and decide whether or not you are going to allow other dopamine supportive elements to go, for instance, into the gym with you. Are you going to listen to music or not? If you enjoy listening to music, well, then flip a coin. And if it comes up heads, bring the music in. If it comes up tails, don't. Okay. Sounds like you're undercutting your own progress, but actually you are serving your own progress, both short-term and long-term. There are activities that we can do that will give us healthy, sustained increases in dopamine, both the peaks when they happen and to maintain or even increase our baseline levels of dopamine. So how do we do that? What are some of these activities? Well, in recent years, there's been a trend toward more people doing so-called cold exposure. Now, this study that I mentioned earlier, human physiological responses to immersion into water of different temperatures, really interesting study that was done and published in the European Journal of Applied Physiology. I can provide a link to that study in the, in the show caption. They looked at people getting exposed to water that was warm, moderately cold, or very cold. It was 32 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius, or 14 degrees Celsius. What they looked at were the concentrations of things like epinephrine and dopamine and so on. And what they found was really interesting. First of all, the changes in adrenaline and noradrenaline, epinephrine and norepinephrine, were immediate and fast. And these were huge increases. But then what was interesting is they observed that dopamine levels started to rise somewhat slowly and then continued to rise and reached levels as high as 2.5 times above baseline. That's a remarkably high increase. Remember, if we go back to our examples of chocolate, sex, a doubling above baseline, nicotine, two and a half times above baseline, cocaine, the increase in dopamine from a cold water exposure of this kind was comparable to what one sees from cocaine, except, except in this case, it wasn't a rise and crash. It was actually a sustained rise in dopamine that took a very long time, up to three hours to come back down to baseline, which is really remarkable. I think this explains some of the positive mental and physical effects that people report subjectively after doing cold water exposure. Please again, approach it with uh, safety and caution in mind, but it is a very potent stimulus. Again, 250% of a rise in baseline, two and a half times rise in baseline rivals that of cocaine, which is really remarkable. 